Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another Friday live stream for American Rum Report at Savvy.co. Uh, I'm here with Brad and Barry Hanneberg of Virago Spirits in Richmond, Virginia. Guys, thanks uh, thanks for joining me here today. Thank thanks you. for having us, Will. Yeah, so uh, before we get started, just want to say hello to everyone uh, tuning in, give you kind of the lay of the land if you're joining us for the first time. I do see some familiar faces over there in the chat. Uh, John Atkins saying hello. Actually, John's in Virginia as well. So he's saying a hello to you guys from Virginia. We know um, uh, if, uh, if you have any questions, by the way, if you're in the audience throughout the presentation, you'll see a button at the bottom that says, ask a question. Uh, feel free to enter it in there. If you see me looking to my left, that's just me checking in and uh, seeing if there are questions coming in. Uh, and last but not least, uh, feel free to invite your friends to join us. So if there's a share button at the top right, you can uh, hit that and uh, share the link on social media to get people to join in. Uh, but with that said, I, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Um, I think, you know, I, I've kind of, I've seen Virago here and there over the past couple of years. I think you guys opened in 2018. You came to market with um, a, 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 a blend of imported rums called Four Point four port rum that I know got a lot of attention and that we're going to talk about at the same time you've been distilling. You have a really unique setup there um, doing direct fire distilling on a Sharon Tay style pot still, which you don't see that many um, rum producers doing uh, in the U S or anywhere else really. So, um, you know, been, been a distillery that I've, I've been kind of keeping an eye on, but haven't had the chance to talk to in detail. So I'm really excited to do that today. I think the best place to start is just, um, you know, for those who are less familiar with you guys, uh, I'd love if you could just bring them up to speed on who y'all are, how you, and how you got started. Sure. Uh, well, I'm Brad, by the way, this is Gary, uh, for those that you don't know. Um, we are a distillery that's just opened up for a few years at this point. Um, we are a family owned business. Uh, we're brothers and there's another brother and my wife is off camera. Um, mm -hmm. We all kind of run it together. It's kind of important to us to do this. We've all had prior careers before this. Um, I'm a lawyer. Barry was an investment banker and a historian. And Bart, who's not on camera, is a uh, involved with the, the bond trading world in Chicago. Did, did um, you say investment banker and historian? <laughs> this is career number three for me. Wow. Okay. That that's a so you got investment banker, historian, distiller. Yeah, that's like yeah. a pretty that's a pretty cool trifecta of, uh, yeah, of jobs. Collecting cards. I have some. Good, I have a good hand. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, and, and to be honest with you, the, the, the uh, diverse nature of our careers has kind of been, you know, melted into what we're doing now and how we're doing it and the equipment that we use. It yeah. all rolls in together. Um, but a, a number of years ago, we've all had successful careers doing other things. And we thought, ah, maybe now is the time to do a family business. Uh, and we thought about, you know, cool things that we could do together. Um, I've been brewing beer uh, since my law school days when I couldn't afford beer. I had to make it myself. Um, <laughs> and so I had the fermentation side down, right? But we had never, we thought yeah, maybe a beer, a brewery would be fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of, what, what, what could we add to that environment? If there's so much going on there, would we really be able to make a mark and, and improve uh, certain uh, products? And we thought, oh, let's take it one step further and go into distilling. Uh, which adds complexity because obviously you can't learning how to do that in the United States is a lot more complicated than elsewhere. Yeah. Um, but we decided to to go down the road that we were going on now just because of its obscure nature. We picked a product that we think is is misunderstood and uh, not well known yet, um, and we thought we would uh, help educate the public and maybe teach some people some things and learn some stuff on our own. Yeah, the other I think I'll add to that on the distilling side is. There's a lot of creativity and innovation and kind of artistic expression that still can be done on the distilling side, whereas a lot of that's already been done on the brewing side. Mm. Um, and distilling, unlike the, the brewing industry where, you know, in the 80s you had questionable quality of beer and craft improved that quality, you didn't really have that issue with distilling. There's the mass uh, produced uh, whiskeys and rums are very, very good but they're not necessarily innovative or as creative uh, as we'd like it to be. So that's where we can leave our mark there is by uh, kind of doing things a little bit differently. And did you guys have rum in mind from day one or was that something, did you kind of like survey different different spirits to focus on initially and, and then decided on rum? I, we, we, the latter. Um, 
we love bourbon just as much as anybody else, but there's a lot of people doing it. We thought, where could we make a mark? Uh, and you look around and, um, and you've done the same thing with, with your business here, is that rum in our mind is the last eight, potentially aged product that really hasn't taken off in terms of just wild uh, acclaim because people don't understand it. And they yeah. forget that back in our colonial days, we were a rum nation. And if mm -hmm. you had money, you drank wine or fortified wine like rum, uh, like Madeira and port. And if you didn't, you drank, you drank rum. As we expanded west, it became more of a whiskey country and people forgot about rum. So we thought, hey, what better way to incorporate Barry's history side and my fermentation side and marketing and everything else and try to bring back a product that has, is steeped in American history, but people have not necessarily latched onto it yet. Mm -hmm. and so how did you guys go from kind of, obviously, uh, Brad, you mentioned you had the home brewing background so you had some knowledge of fermentation and stuff like that um but i from what i understand you guys are pretty hands-on in the distillation process you're you, you know you're not just uh hiring people to do everything for you um you're, you're how did, the people who've been hired I'm what's that i'm waiting for a paycheck i have a <laughs> right yeah um so so how did you go about uh you know acquiring the knowledge necessary um to, to start distilling like where did did you did you go to classes um what, what did that process look like for you answers to kind of all of the above wherever the options are so brad i mean if you think of distilling as having um you know the process of creating an age spirit having a number of distinct set steps the first one is fermentation brad had a lot of experience with that so we felt comfortable with it but distilling was new to us mm -hmm. and um it's not something you just kind of jump into uh, there's a lot of uh, tricks to the trade, so to speak. And legality. For that matter. And legality. The lawyer and me kind of got nervous. When, you know, <laughs> theoretically, you do anything with the distillation side without a license, that's that's a problem. So I had a, we had to get creative. Let's just say that. But from a from a above board side, let's just say that you know if there's a book we read it, if there's a class we took it, and, and most importantly is once we settled on what we wanted to produce and the style we wanted to produce it. We got involved with a number of people that we spent time with and essentially worked with them as consultants, uh, okay. both in the training of our particular skill uh, as well as experts on our, our the spirits we're going to produce, which those uh, spirits that are, are we're focusing on are fruit brandies and rum. Okay. Um, so this is one of the reasons why our still is so appropriate to what we do. But we had no, uh, we didn't claim to be the experts we weren't. And sure. while we were learning, we would bring those people in that were experts to learn from them. And we continue to do that um, to make sure that what we put down is good. And we were fascinated with the cognac business uh, in France. And that's why the still we have is what it is. And the people that we've uh, worked with are well-versed. Um, one guy in particular, his family is hundreds of years of cognac manufacturing. Uh, and uh, we were the beneficiaries of his experience. And the, the still came from a cognac producer, right? That's correct. It is a, I don't know uh, if it's a you know, release now, but it was officially owned by a company called Hardy Cognac. Okay. And uh, their cons uh, production was consolidated, um, I think, when they were acquired by another brand. And this, uh, this still came from the market. And we got it off the market. Got it. Took it. A, a number of years to get it, though. It was not necessarily something. We've been playing this, with this, this concept for five or six yeah. years. Mm. Uh, already uh, we're only two years into the distillation cycle but we've been messing around with this for the last yes. several years trying to find a still and finding these things is is difficult there's probably half a dozen half dozen or so there's yeah uh, uh, in the states uh, in the yeah the nearest one to us is in the upstate new york and it's a smaller version of ours that they make apple brandy on but that's mm -hmm. yeah i know the the only producers that come to mind for me i know Montagna out in Colorado is has kind of cognac style stills. They do direct. I think they're smaller than the one that you guys have. Smaller, slightly, slightly smaller, yeah. And then there's a, there's a producer in in Puerto Rico um, called San Juan Artisan Distillers. Are you familiar with them? Uh, yes, <laughs> that's our, our our friend works with them as well. Oh, great! Okay, I love love seeing the connections come together. Yeah, they I, they got their stills from uh, uh, Trinidad. They they used to be. Uh, used for tin cane rum, which is kind of a, it's it's a rum that was discontinued. It was owned by Moa Hennessy um, and has kind of a cult following now. I always see people looking for bottles of tin cane rum in old liquor stores and stuff like that. So yeah, I know those stills are rare to come across. Um, 
But uh, actually 15, uh, 10 more of them, I think. There's 10 more. Of Gallo is getting into the, uh, everybody thinks Gallo is the jug wine, but they actually own a, a variety of very high end wines. And they had mothballed probably a 10 or 12 of these uh -huh. in Northern California. And the guys that we worked with have been engaged by Gallo now to recondition those stills and bring them back to life. So okay. our number, you know, half dozen that's in existence at the moment will suddenly be tripled uh, at some point in the near future. Got it. Yeah, and just so everyone kind of like, there's a picture in the background behind us, but this is a sort of a look at what that still looks like. Um, and I want to get into, you know, the 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 run that you guys are making on this. But before we do that, I wanted to start with um, kind of the the product that you went to market with initially, which was uh, a blend of imported rums, as I mentioned earlier, called Four Port Rum. Um, has rums from Barbados, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Panama. Um, so how did you make the decision to, to come to market with, with that blend rather than relying just on, you know, rums that you were distilling? Sure. Uh, I guess the first question is, what do you want to leave when you go out into the market? Yeah. And the question really is, do you want to be, have your first foray in, into the market, your first step forward to be an unaged rum? And uh, that market is, it's not even unaged, let's say white rum at that, uh, but mm -hmm. that was dominated by Bacardi, and they're also a low-cost producer, and they have a huge marketing budget. Uh, yeah. Moreover, the Bacardi product's not unaged. Right. It's they aged and then filtered. Or filtered out. Same mm -hmm. thing with Plantation Three Star. So all the major brands that are used as rail uh, ingredients and bars uh, are actually aged products. Mm -hmm. So do we want to compete with those with an unaged rum? Uh, no, is the answer we came <laughs> up with. Um, we wanted to play in the aged rum category. It's where our passion lies. Uh, there's a lot of creativity you can do on the aging side. And uh, we're not magicians. We couldn't magically age our spirits. Uh, so we decided to play in the secondary market. And there's a, a really kind of robust secondary market that you can access by virtue of the fact that all major rum producers, just like McDonald's or Budweiser, they have to hit to a particular uh, flavor profile. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when you open every cask, every cask will taste a little bit different. So they're constantly blending from here uh, and there, from this ca uh, cask, from that batch. Uh, and periodically they'll review and they'll see they have a bunch of rum that's really, really good, but just doesn't fit in the blend. That rum goes to a secondary market. And from that market, approach things sort of almost as tabula rasa. Uh, and the access of this uh, this market basically gave us a lot of freedom to be creative with what we wanted to do and allowed us uh, to have the patience to distill our own rum and age it uh, the way we want to age it without having to rush it to market. I mean, blending sure. actually is it's an interesting thing. We knew that after we distilled our own rum, at some point in time, we would have to blend our different casks together. And it's a skill set that you have to hone over time. And we really didn't want to wait seven years to learn how to do that, right? Yeah. So, but for 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 some reason, Americans uh, American drinkers often think of blended products as inferior. Inferior, or, yeah. yeah. But yet, if you go back in Barbadian uh, rum history, or you go to Scotland, it, the you know the merchant bottlers and blenders are a it's an art form, right? Yeah. Um, and so we're again half of what we're doing is educating ourselves and our customers as to the the wide expanse that a, a, the flavor profile that a rum can provide. Uh, and we we can express that through blending. And as long as people understand that, it, you know, we'll have our blended side and our distilled side, and each one of them can be awesome in their own way. Uh, I think that that's something that Americans have yet to kind of learn, and we're looking to you know help with that process. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so, um, just to give people uh, a look at kind of what these look like. Um, so the the rum on the far left is the original, the, the first blend you went to market with. Um, like I said, uh, four uh, origins, Barbados, Jamaica, Nicaragua, Panama. Um, I'm imagining it was a process in order to get to that point where you had that right combination that you really felt hit the sweet spot, both of what you wanted in terms of quality and what you wanted in terms of, you know, affordability, price point, access to be able to put it out consistently. Um, what what was the the process like of, of going through blends, tasting different things. How did you kind of develop this? Well, for, first I'll say it was a fun process. Yeah, uh, tasting a lot of rum, I would imagine. 
you know, the secondary market was critical to it. Um, and, you know, starting out, you're not going to necessarily have uh, the ability to have personal relationships with every distillery in the Caribbean throughout yeah. the world. Uh, so we work with uh, a professional blender um, that has access to the libraries. And they have an absolutely huge library uh, of different rums you can sample. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we started out with is you, you have to have kind of a vision for what you're going for. And we wanted the product that was differentiated, that stood out. And uh, one way we thought of doing that was, A, to have a rum with no sugar added that is attractive to whiskey drinkers. Mm -hmm. And B, to have one that kind of sits between the different styles. Because that really seemed interesting to us. Rather than going straight up Jamaican or Barbadian or Spanish or French style. But what happens if you start taking the, high, uh, the, the positive aspects, the delicious aspects of each of those, and you incorporate them together in a way that the, the sum is greater than the, uh, or the, the totality is greater than some of the parts. And that's the, kind of the approach we went with. And um, we went through about two dozen different variants over time. At some point in time, we had French agricole rum in there. We tried it with wow. the in Iraq. Um, you know, we had some Demerara in there. We tried a bunch of different things, but what really worked with us was that balance between the British and Spanish style. You get a little bit of the Jamaican funk in there, uh, the kind of the balance, you get a little bit of rum, the smoothness of the Spanish rums. But it took a while to get there. We, and we thought there was no reason for us to try and compete, whether it's our distilling or our blending, with existing products from mm -hmm. that are very specific. I mean, if we're, there's no, the Barbadians are always going to be able to, to make their rum specifically in accordance with their standard. We would never improve upon that, right? Same with Jamaicans. Uh, so, but we can play with mixing them together and blending them together and coming up with something completely unique, which if you think about it is ultimately American, right? We're a mixing pot of individual cultures to begin with. Our rum is a reflection. Yeah. Rather than trying to beat them at their game, we, you know, no one's gonna make a better Jamaican rum than a Jamaican producer. Yeah. We have hundreds of years of doing that. But we can do things a little bit differently. We can introduce some new elements, and that's where we, we are trying to shine by kind of blending tradition and innovation together. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm you know, I see, uh, I keep an eye on all of the, as, as close as I can on all the releases. Flow. I mean, there's um, over 500 different craft distilleries across the U.S. who are putting out rums now, and I try to keep an eye on, you know, what's coming out. And every now and then I'll see one releasing, you know, a product that, they're kind of overtly marketing is like a Jamaican style rum. And I always think to myself, I understand being influenced by Jamaican rum, but trying to put one out there that you're positioning as a Jamaican style rum made in the US just seems like such an uphill battle to climb when you're competing on the shelf against, you know, people with uh, centuries of experience in developing that style. Game. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. So to, to go back to the, there were a couple of other bottles on here. Um, you've done two other editions of the four port blend uh, that you did secondary maturations in different casks. You did a sherry cask finish, uh, a port cask finish. Um, so when you guys did that, were you are you casking those in Virginia at the distillery, or are you having that done at the blending house? What what is what does that process look like? That that's done here. Uh, and the way to think about the, the four port series as a whole, so think of four port as being the flagship of, of our blended operation. Mm -hmm. And over time, called the next couple of years, we'll have maybe a half a dozen different expressions. The first two of which are the version that uh, was finished in Ruby Port casks and the version that was finished in Pedro Mena Sherry casks. We have a, a 30 year old cognac cask in the back. We'll have a Sauterne, a Tokai, a Madeira. Oh, think wow. of a family of expressions. And our idea, uh, as we thought about it, was wouldn't it be cool as a consumer to come in and get a little a pack, let's say a sample pack of the original in five or six different expressions to see the impact that each of those finishing casts has on the spirit, how it transforms it, how very different each of those versions can be. Uh, and that's both kind of eye-opening, I think, as a consumer, uh, and a lot of fun because they're, they're really quite different. We play with them in the distillery. I mean, uh, and if you didn't know that these were the same spirits, mm -hmm. I'm not sure you would know that they're all based upon the four-port because that finish really does impact it, uh, in, in, I think, in a positive way. I mean, not that I don't like four-port, I do, but each one of them has become into their own, uh, coming to their own at this point, and it's really kind of neat. We are staying with fortified wine barrels for the time being, okay. um, just because we don't necessarily want to worry about any barrels that 
sour, okay, with a higher alcohol proof. I think we think they're a little bit more robust. Uh, but you're referring to like wine barrels. Wine barrels, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. We we not that red wine barrels wouldn't work. We've stayed away from that to this point for fear that God knows what how old the barrels are when we get them, and we want to make sure that we don't have any any issues with that. So, but the fortified wines tend to hold up a little bit better in my opinion. The cognac is doing great. The cognac is great. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. as far as where we get it from, I mean, we we work with a number of suppliers to get them from uh, their place of origin. So the pork casts were from the Douro Valley in Portugal. Sherry casts were from Spain. The cognac casts, the 30-year-old cognac casts from the cognac region. So we're trying to go back as much as possible to the original uh, point of uh, production and get them as fresh, fresh as possible. Once they get here, we uh, basically inspect them to make sure they're still fresh, and then we fill them with pork port. And we'll monitor every month, and we'll just take samples along the way. And when it's done, it's done. Yeah. So the the port cast went nine months in in a finishing barrel, and then the sherry went about five or six. Yeah. And what's yeah. interesting about the uh, the uh, uh, cognac barrels is that they're because they're thirty years old at this point. Most most of the tannins been already removed from that. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say it's a neutral barrel, but it's a lot more neutral than the other ones were. So we're kind of judging how long we can keep or how long we want to keep. The rum in there because literally we could probably go a lot longer with, uh, with the right. cognac barrels than we would with the other two just because of their more neutral right not, it's not it's not just going to get overwhelmed by that cask correct right. yeah yeah i i've always you know you're talking about being able to taste uh the same blend uh in in these you know different contexts where one variable has been changed in it um, I've always found found that process to be, you know, really instructive with spirits, whether it's something like cask finishes or tasting the same thing at different proofs and stuff like that. But just being able to have another reference point that's grounded in the in some common factor and being able to uh, experience the differences right there is 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 to me one of the most you know helpful exercises you can do um, as anyone who enjoys spirits. Um, and also we had John Atkins, by the way. Uh, says the four port cask is an excellent rum uh, for mixing in cocktails as well as it will sip, which I would imagine is kind of what you guys are going for. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the goal. So. Yeah. It's a very good compliment. compliment. Yeah. But absolutely. I think your point is correct. I mean, the barrel is just another ingredient, right? It's not a vessel you put it in and you leave it out. I mean, it, it's the spirits transforming in the barrel, especially during when you're actually doing your proper aging in it. And you need to treat that barrel and the cellaring process as uh, as a really kind of uh, a process of its own that you need to respect. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so to think of the barrel as an ingredient is really important. And that's why I think this finishing kind of thing is, is really kind of instructive because you can see or rather taste firsthand the impact that each individual barrel has in the spirit. 